title of the message tonight, if I could give it a title, would be this. God makes a wrong turn right. And as soon as I committed to sharing my testimony, I was dealing with a lot of shame and guilt and not wanting to. Who wants to talk about their failed past? Anyone up there? Just curious. Oh, you do? Okay, great. There's one guy. But you do if it will help others. That's probably what he's talking about, too, and what I'm referring to. If it, if it will help others. And talking about what God has done on, in your life, and I say this um, with, with all sincerity, if, if anybody should not be up here right now, it's me. And what God can do through those who submit and surrender their lives to Him is amazing. But it's also challenging because it's a testimony, it's not a life story. And I'm hoping to, to maybe release more in the future about just the life story about our marriage with, with, with Morgan, our wonderful kids. And, but it's not really a life story. It's not about the church. If you watch on YouTube, it's about 25 minutes long. We have our 10-year story about the church. But this is really a testimony of how God radically and profoundly changed my life and how I believe he can greatly impact you tonight as well. And so if you hear it, you're hearing this and you know someone who needs to hear this, I would encourage you to drag them to church. It's okay to do that. At 9 and 11 tomorrow, one of those times, get them to church, have them be, have them be uh, convicted by the word of God. So challenge number one is how do I condense the testimony into 30 minutes. That's very difficult. So an hour and a half message got down to about an hour and I got down to about 30 minutes or so. And I'm hoping to share more in the future, but I just want to, and it's not about me sharing my story. The whole point of this is to point us to an all-sufficient Savior and to show you and encourage you on how can God can take your brokenness and turn it into something that is absolutely unbreakable. And I thank God. I love that song. I've, I, I came broken to be mended. I came, I came empty to be filled. And, and God does that. He takes the least likely and begins to, begins to change that person because then he gets all the glory. You think I'm up here because I, of my Ph.D.? I don't have one just in case you don't know. School was very challenging for me. But let me start. I just had to itemize everything. Let me start at the beginning. I was born right there. Not in this parking lot here, but right over there. Lancaster Hospital. Community. Back then, I think it's still Antelope Valley Hospital. I was actually born there. And we had a very interesting mix in our family. My mom was from... Southern California, think of surfing, beaches, and my dad was from the farms of Oklahoma. So that's a very interesting mix. And I was taught hard work at a very young age, something that we are lacking today in this generation. He, we were in construction and very hard work and and it was, it was good. Now looking back, those, those areas of discipline and working hard and the problem, though, is I became a workaholic. Anybody can relate to that? And I'm gonna, I'll hopefully talk about that in a little bit. But I was born here at this hospital. We were raised in Quartz Hill, California. Anybody from Quartz Hill, California here? Oh, there's not too many people. I mean, everybody's must moved out of California. And this is what people are moving in now. But I was born, and, and, and I'm actually, believe it or not, I was born in a house on M12. In 50th Street West, and I'm going to go check out the house tomorrow. First time in 40 years. I reached out to the person. I just want to see that and kind of relive that. And then my dad built the Little League field. My grandpa did on M4 in Quartz Hill. Our office work yard was on M2. And so everything was centered on Quartz Hill, California. Drank my first beer on, in Quartz Hill and, and got hooked to alcohol at a young age. And it was, it was interesting times because back then you didn't have all of this, this population. It was a small town. There was uh, Rancho Vista, was almond, a lot of uh, desert, and then there was almond orchards in Quartz Hill. Nothing but almond orchards up the, the, the 60th Street there. And it was just a very interesting time to live. And the early years then were challenging because what I came to find out, 
I wondered why school was so challenging for me. I mean, I, I just hated going to school. I had to actually cheat through school. I was one of those kids who was too embarrassed to ask the teacher, I have a question on this, just about on everything. And so I just sat quietly in the back and barely got through it. And now looking later, having, I've had all the characteristics of dyslexia. And my mom told me early on I had a learning disability or speech impediment. I remember sitting with a speech teacher telling me to, to uh, silly Sally licked seven suckers and, and the, the S's and speech. And, and, and I just hated speaking in front of, in front of people. I hated t talking in front of people. I was very shy because I felt I was very stupid. I couldn't, I, math today, even my kids, 10 years old, go ask your mom, because I have no clue what pi equals square is. And, and I just, there's just, so God using that, and that, that coming from that, I remember my dad couldn't re write very well. I couldn't write very well until, you know, even in my early 20s, misspelling a lot of words. And so, you know, you can picture that farm mentality, right? Oklahoma, but drive my mom crazy because she's from Southern California. She went to a prep school. And so I had the best of both worlds there. And that was a very interesting dynamic. And I praise God for my mom because it was her prayers that led us through some difficult seasons. So because of this and, and not accelerating uh, in school and playing baseball. I play baseball and I was doing very well in baseball all-stars. And it was back when they first came out with the, um, the machines that would measure, you know, how fast you're throwing it. I'm throwing mid sixties and little league and you, you know, everything, you know, my dad, we've got a batting cage. We've got, you know, sports is our dream. And then this happens. And I had, I had, I had to have surgery at 12 years old down in, in Los Angeles and I can never straighten my arm since then. And my baseball dreams were over at 12, basically. So you go from the height of going somewhere, you think, and then now just depression sets in. I remember that's when I started uh, to drink, actually. I found some alcohol at a friend's house at 12 years old. It was around the same time that my dad thought he would try to get me to taste a beer and think I wouldn't like it, but the opposite happened. And I remember, and never forget, I remember the guy's house, Gene Bennett. He was a concrete masonry on M4. Here's a Coors banquet. And I liked it at 12 years old. And that kind of set the pattern because that was for me to escape. And that's why a lot of people turn to things like that. It, it's an escape mechanism. It's a way to, to undo the hurt that you've been feeling. And, and any time in rehab or anything, you, you'll understand those triggers that, that bring you back. And a lot of that is linked to your past. And so during this time of, of being 12 years old, struggling at that time now with my weight, Believe it or not, it was, a, it was a battle for me, struggling with my weight. I would gain weight easy. My People would make fun of me. My dad would call me lead britches. You know, pull up your britches and you're getting chubby. And, and so there's a lot of that mocking because he wasn't a believer. And that can really damage a child, by the way, if you're out there. Build up your kids. Don't mock them. Don't tease them, uh, f especially fathers. And so through that... I was led to a, a church camp up here in, I don't know exactly which one, probably by Mount uh, uh, Wrightwood. And I repented and I believed in Jesus Christ at 12 years old. But then the pull of the world and the pull of friendships, the wrong friendships pulled me in the wrong direction. And for 17 years, I lived as a prodigal. As I was growing up, my best friend, his dad would, would make crystal myth. And he would give us free eight balls. He would take us to Las Vegas at 17 years old. Stay up all weekend. Ruining my life at a very young age. Trapped. And when you get trapped in this kind of darkness, if you've been there, you know what I'm talking about. It's hard to get out of. Only one person can set you free. And so as I got older, 18, 19, 20, what I did instead of turning to these different things... I found something called steroids. I don't know if you, many of you know what that is. Obviously, they call them anabolic steroids. They are also, they, they build up 
muscle. That's what they do. Something like growth hormone will add muscle cells, but steroids are cell volumizers. They make your muscles bigger, and you can, a lot of these guys that you say, wow, look at that guy, like the rock or whatever. Trust me, they are performance-enhancing drugs. And I took things from veterinarians uh, called Winstrow-V, Equipoise, uh, testosterone sustenate, Dianabol, DECA. I started to study these things. I started to read my own blood tests and HDL and LDL levels and triglycerides and became very educated in this, this dark world of, of steroids and began to get bigger and bigger and stronger and, and want to be the biggest guy at the gym. And I, I would go in and warm up bench pressing with 315 pounds just to warm up. And getting, you know, just that was my identity now and, and looking for, in, for identity in everything but the right things. And anytime you look into for something to satisfy you other than God, you will be left empty and depressed. Just like buying that new car in about a month, you're unsatisfied. The smell is worn away and, and you're left with this, this choice you made. But even before then, I want to back up a little bit. We're, I'm going to show a few pictures, actually, tomorrow at the church where we have the, I don't think we have them here on the slides. But uh, after baseball surgery, I was able to go to the San Diego School of Baseball. And uh, got, my arm got a little bit better, but I was always a year behind. And then a couple guys were recruited from California to go and represent the United States wasn't a big deal. I mean, you just paid enough money and you got you were good enough. And they they sent us to Taiwan to play for ten days. And to say we got spanked is an understatement. Because while we were out drinking till one in the morning, guess what they were doing? Sleeping. And I've never been beat so bad in baseball. Those guys can play. And then we happen to have a two day layover in Hawaii at seventeen eighteen. And so these patterns are developing at an early age, and then getting involved with the steroids and um, buying them and even selling them before it was a federal offense. So I'm just a mess. I'm an alcoholic on the weekends, but I can stop to work and to pay the bills. And then I'm also just injecting. What you do is you inject them in your, in your, in your thigh here or your shoulder, or you take the, the tablets, something like Anadrol, Anavar, things that are very toxic on your liver, but very, make you very aggressive. The reason that the steroids are dangerous is because you're elevating testosterone levels. And men are already kind of angry, right, sometimes. Well, imagine timesing that by three or four. That's why they call it roid rage. And that's why you're seeing on the, on the news a lot now, road rage. Road rage, a lot of the road rage, I think, has to do with caffeine, but I'll leave that to a different topic. But roid rage was something real. You would just have tons of testosterone, and you were just angry and upset. And what I decided to do at that point is uh, was partying, working construction. My dad actually had to lay me off. I had to go get a job in 1990, I believe, is when it fell out of the market. So I've been watching. I've been know how, how, how the market has fallen many times and picked itself back up. The point I'm getting at is a hard point. Um, so I'm kind of stalling here. But I met a girl in 1991, and I conceded to the abortion. And I remember even breaking the news to my daughter a couple years ago and how it affected her. And it's always very difficult to talk about, but I know a lot of people in this area, arena, can relate. I still know where the clinic is, down on Mission Boulevard by El Presidente Restaurant. I was thinking about driving down there, just, just praying and for God to, you know, 30 years later and wondering what that child would look like, a boy or a girl. And so now you throw that into the mix. And at that point, you don't really care because you're not walking with the Lord. They tell you it's just a little tissue. And it wasn't until I came back to the Lord that it really, really broke my heart. And really, I broke down in a hotel room one night in 2008. And I said, Lord, if you'll use me. I'll never remain silent about this topic. And I was in construction. I wasn't preaching. And God, um, God honored that commitment and that promise. And so that was 1991. Then around 1992, strep throat went to my heart as a secondary viral infection. I felt like I was having a heart attack. I couldn't breathe. I said, I guess I got to get to the hospital. And, you know, in the emergency room, they're not very much in a hurry, are they? And so I sat there, I think, for about an hour. 
Um, basically, when they hooked me up to the EKG at 23 years old, I guess, I'd have to do the numbers, 1992, 90, yeah, 92, uh, they, they said, cardiologist stat, cardiologist stat, that's all I remember. Then they got me on a gurney and did all the tests with running dye in your veins and the, all these different things. Apparently, the, 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 it was my, myopericarditis, the inflammation around my, the mu heart muscle. The, the muscle around your heart was, infl was inflamed, and it was infected, and it was, it was um, growing. It was, it was diseased around that heart, myopericarditis. And so I was in the hospital for four days, and thinking that would take me back to the Lord, it didn't. It didn't. It just furthered my debauchery and abuse of alcohol when I got out. But I remember the doctor said, Shane, and it was true for many years after, he said, you're going to be very susceptible to upper respiratory viruses. And what are we in right now? And so a lot of people think, well, Shane, you don't care about the COVID. You're not doing, you know, trust me. I've got, I, if I get strep throat again, there's a good chance it will go right to that area. Not even strep throat, upper respiratory infection will do that. And it's, it's, a, it's, it's a real thing for me. I have to deal with that. I have to jump right on these things. I usually use a lot of natural remedies and things like that. But I got out of the hospital, 1992, and I said, okay, I've got to do something with my life. So I picked 24-hour fitness. It was actually called Family Fitness Centers. Anyone remember that? Family Fitness Centers, and we merged with 24-Hour Nautilus, and it became 24-Hour Fitness about 1998 or so. But anyway, I got involved in 24-Hour Fitness in 1992, 93, 94, 95, 96, 97, so about eight years there. And what I did, I worked my tail off. Seven days a week, workaholic, that kicks in, the hard work, first there, last to leave, seven days a week, many times, and I escalated quickly up the corporate ladder, became a co-manager six months into it. And then I managed my own fitness center about a, a year or two after that. And then they put me over other multiple clubs, district manager. And at this point, they were what you would call managing partners. A managing partner was, for example, if I had a $40,000 payroll budget at one of my gyms per month, and I only spent 32000 of it, guess who got the 8000 So I was, I was on payroll. I was watching it and making sure people weren't working too much overtime. On top of that, we had commissions. We had bonus. It was about a fifteen dollars to $20,000 a month job for a 25-year-old kid. And so I bought a house in Quartz Hill, built a house, a custom house in Quartz Hill on M14, and was really living what they would consider the good life, right? Just get drunk on the weekend, still show up for work on Monday. This is pretty good. And in the gym business. And then we would drive down to uh, Irvine and have board meetings. And I would have to talk to a board of directors and explain how I'm going to produce $300,000 in revenue per month. And how I would have to look at the spreadsheets. I'd have to deal with our equal opportunity employment side and human resources in dealing with sexual harassment cases and, and all kinds of things. Looking back, I see how it prepared me for what I'm doing now. Be all from the sexual harassment thing, of course. That, but from the, from the numbers and the budgeting and all the different things, and even, even that sexual harassment or EEO violations or learning how to lead people and have employees. I was, oversaw 150 employees at one time, personal training departments. And so God used all that and I excelled at it because that's what I love to do. And being in the fitness industry, that's why I still have a passion for fitness and really people taking care of their body because I've seen the difference that it can make. It can dramatically improve your life. So I'm getting to another difficult part that I'm trying to um, avoid as well. What happened is I met an, uh, a, a woman in 1994 and... I take full responsibility. It ended in divorce. After four years of marriage, the basically people asked, what happened? I said, well, addiction, arrogance, and anger. Those three things hit. And it destroyed the marriage. Now, I'm not going to get into a lot of detail, but things happened to where what we would call, we consider in the church community, biblically released. Uh, I, would, I would be 
biblically released from the marriage. So in other words, I take full responsibility as the man for not walking with God, not, not praying, not, not doing anything, but just caring about my own self. But then it led to things to where I was eventually released from that marriage. And in 1998, that is when it, it, the divorce went through. And basically a broken child from a broken home, it led to a broken marriage. Uh, we were not walking with the Lord. But God used that as, as shameful as it, it, as it is, and I don't like to talk about it because, you know, if you've been there, you got the big, you got the big D on your forehead, right? They think divorce is the unpardonable sin. But looking back to where it has brought me, I thank God that he allowed that to break me. That he allowed that to bring the prodigal son home. That he got me to my knees and I humbled myself. And even to, even to this day, my wife can attest to this, about once a month, a listener writes me and they say, you need to repent to your congregation. You are living in adultery. I'm like, no, sir, there's things called biblically released. So we can walk you through the scriptures, but they're so arrogant and hard hearted that they don't want to hear that. And so after three years, actually what I'd say 1998, I call the year of decadence. <laughs> That's when all hell broke loose because now you're free and you're going back to, know, back to what you know. And last week or two weeks ago, I talked to you about one of those times in 1998. I remember I took my friend's Mustang after schooners. You remember schooners over here in the old location? No? Okay, that's good. But I got on, on, on took his Mustang, was heading down Avenue J, and I decided to hit the nitrous oxide button. And before I know it, I'm doing 120 some miles an hour down the down J, and it's just the car's starting to shake, and I know if I'm going off, I'm done. And I slowed down. And just you know, I pray a little bit back then. I had religion, but not a relationship. And so, at the end of that whole year of 1998, God, 24-hour fitness actually demoted me because my numbers were suffering. Everything was falling apart, and it was in 19, I think it was January 1999. I'll never forget, there was a preacher on, on t TV, and I, I, didn't, I didn't quite know what I was feeling, but I could somehow relate and say, that's what I'm going to do someday. Isn't that so foolish? I mean, I, I, could, I mean, that's what I want to do, Lord. That's what I want to do. Oh, God, if you would use me again. And he started to preach about the message was detours to destiny. And he, the life of Samson, he said, the enemy has taken out your eyes. The enemy is taking you down. But if you call out to God again, if you cry out to God, oh, like Samson, he began to push on the pillars and God began to renew his strength. And I remember crying out to God and weeping and weeping, saying, oh, God, would you use me? And you, you, would, you, would you break me again? Oh, God, I need you like never before. And I begin to pour out my heart and I begin to cry. And the Holy Spirit just empowered me and came upon me like nothing I've ever felt before. And the word of God now becomes alive. And I want to put on worship. I want to, all I want to do is put on worship and put on worship. And back then I was listening to just mainly country music. And a lot of Metallica and hard metal when I wanted to work out. But you know the country music. Back then it was Brooks and Dunn's and Garth Brooks and, 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 who, and George Strait and all. And, and today it would probably be like Luke Bryan for some of you contemporaries. It was, I, I like him. I wish he was a Christian. And more, or maybe he is. I don't know. I wish the music was a little more Christ-centered. But anyway, I love that because I could relate to that. A country boy can survive. And I, I had a shotgun, a 12-gauge. I ran a trout line. I've skinned a buck. And I can relate to these songs. And so, I, I, but I pushed that away and said, I don't want this anymore because it makes me want to drink and hop on a train and just leave. I want, it was Darlene Check and Hillsong back when they were, they were singing and, and I was just, now, now I'm on fire for God and I'm like, what's going on? What's going on inside of me? And this is where God can make a wrong turn right. He can take all the mess, all the shame, all the guilt, and he begins to change that and he begins to turn you in a right direction. He focused me on the sun. He focused me on the cross. And I said, oh, but God, I've done too much damage. He said, watch what I do in the clay and the hands of a potter. I will rebuild what the enemy tried to destroy. I will return that what was taken away from you. I will bind up the broken. I will strengthen the sick. I will feed the proud and the arrogant in judgment. Thus saith the Lord. And I begin to love his word. I begin to just spend time with God. And I was single for three years and I would never take that back again. 
Oh, we'd spend hours reading the Word of God, crying over the Word of God, and believe it, during this time, I was actually still contending for a marriage from two or three years prior, praying for that, Lord, if that's your will. If that's your will, I've made a mistake. I know I'm released biblically in different areas, but God, I, I felt like a failure, and I would contend, and I would contend for that, and God kept shutting that door. And so after about three years, as I was praying and praying, I met Morgan at the gym, of all places. She was actually, I think, she might, she might kill me for saying this, but I think it's okay. She was dating one of my salesmen. And I, I kid you not, I said, how did he get her? I would walk around, how did he get her? That, I do not understand that. And a long story short, we ran into each other, uh, and then we went on a, a, a date and I said, ah, this isn't really going to work right now. I'm just coming back to the Lord. She went forward at a Greg Laurie conference. Forward as an altar call earlier, I think that year. And so we weren't both in a good spot. And so another, about a year later, I ran into, I saw her at church, at a church, uh, Central Christian Church, right here on Avenue J, a Sunday night for young adults. I'm getting up and I see her and like, wow, okay. Ask her to dinner, and as they say, what do they say? The rest is history. Five kids later, and uh, the church, and so much to that. But during that, that season of, of coming back to God, right when that happened, I said, I got to get out of the gym business. So I left 24-hour fitness, stock options, everything. Get, I'm glad I did now because it went bankrupt. But, but gave up all that uh, severance, everything, and just move back home with my mom and begin to write the books. And you might say, how did you write books when you didn't even gra barely graduate high school? You couldn't spell. Oh, that's the, that's the question I'm still asking many years later. What happened is I would give the manuscript to my mom and she would tear it up. It looked like it didn't even look like I said, mom, I didn't even write this book anymore. You, you just redlined everything. I mean, she would cross out the whole page and say at the top, Shane, people don't want to hear about this. Get right to the point. And so just painstaking, painstaking, editing and editing and prepositions and word usage. And, and so I was learning through that school of hard knocks. And then came the first book on weight loss and then the next book. And then I was asked to speak at different men's events with Calvary Chapel men's events and men's breakfasts and more books would come out. The funny thing is I don't like writing books. I don't want to write books. I get mad when God puts a book on my heart because I'm like, oh, here we go again. And it's going to be a long process. And there are two books I just released on my sabbatical. I just began writing and writing and writing and writing, and I couldn't stop during this time. And that's how God does it. And then I give it to an editor. It really cleans it up. And so it's funny that God would use something like this. I hated speaking in front of people. I was ashamed to be a Christian. And if you're not full of God's spirit, you're ashamed to be a Christian. You don't want to, you have this persona, especially men, tough guy, right? And so now I'm preaching. Now I'm writing all, all these things that were absolutely impossible. But I want to get to the, the really the takeaways. I don't want to spend too much time here. I'm going to actually go into more detail tomorrow, show some pictures tomorrow because we have a little bit more time. But from this meeting Morgan, getting married, her being just God designed her perfectly for a pastor's wife, and then God decided to play the ultimate card on us and call us to plant a church. And that was more for me, I think, than anyone else, because it, it, shape, it shapes you, it, and, and it, it, it really cuts to the heart, and it's, it's self-sacrifice, and God really used that to mold us and shape us, and that happened in September, September 25th, 2010, is when we planted Westside Christian Fellowship. So that's an hour and a half into about 30 minutes of kind of where I've came over this broad spectrum. That's why I've written books on addiction. You can pick up at the, at the church for free. It's called Help, I'm Addicted. I've written books on fasting, on healthy living, on books for men, things that God has put on my heart from the Word of God. But I, wanna, I don't want to leave you just with that. I want to give you the five key takeaways. Number one, you need to know this tonight. I don't know where you're at, but you need to know that God looks at your heart. God looks at your heart, not who you are as far as what you've accomplished. 
or how you look, your appearance. God looks at the heart. 1 Corinthians one twenty six. God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of this world to put to shame the things which are mighty. That no flesh should glory in his presence. So the takeaway is this. No matter how far you've drifted. No matter what your past looks like. No matter what you, you think you're, you're stupid or you don't have any experience experience in this. Actually, God, I found, is looking for those type of people who say, if it wasn't for the grace of God, there go I. Lord, no flesh is going to glory in your presence. I'm not going to come up here and say, look at what Shane has done. My whole testimony, my whole life screams, look at what God has done. He should have killed me years ago, but he held me up and he said, son, deliver the message of hope and redemption. And the f- God uses it to confound the wise. I love when PhDs come and say, how do you do that? You don't even have a degree. And I say, I have what you don't have. The spirit of the living God. So many people, so many people look at, I mean, I'm not going to get, I've shared this before, but there's a church really close by here. Before I started the church, or actually after we started it, I think, after we started, we were going to think about uh, using, you know, merging or coming together. And I said, Hey, I know there's a pastor's position available. Can I meet with you and, and, and just talk? And they said, no, you didn't go to school. We're looking for someone who has a degree. And it just struck me odd is well, what about if you, ha- you don't have a master's degree, but you have a degree from the master because when God calls you, no one can stop you. I'm not, I'm not saying you go, you're, you, you just go home and you're, you don't look to the word of God. You don't educate yourself. Of course you do. But when, but the scripture says they were confounded be, because of the wisdom of the disciples. Then they realized they had no teaching. They, had, they went to school. They didn't ever went to school, but they realized that they had spent time with Jesus. And then what the enemy will use is he'll use your past or he'll use what man considers Oh, you got to go to school. You got to do this. You got to have a degree. You got to be very smart. You better be smart in the things of God is what you need to be smart in. And God can use you. I'm not against education, but I'm, I'm for putting God first. So God will look at your heart and use you. And then another point, another key takeaway is there is another in the fire with you. There is another in the fire with you. Of course, Of course, that comes from Daniel. Many of you know the story. King Nebuchadnezzar said, did we not cast three men bound into the midst of the fire? Look, I see four men walking around. They are not hurt. And the form of the fourth is like the son of God. There is another in the fire. What do I mean by that? I'm still standing as are many of you, most of you, because there's another in the fire with you. There's somebody holding you. There's somebody walking you through. Though the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, even if he falls, the Lord will pull you up with his right hand. You need to know that you, you can encourage yourself, but it's ultimately God who walks through the fires with you. And then you can say like the writers of the Bible, Oh, though the flood comes over me, it will not consume me. Though I walk through the waters, it will not overflow me. Though I walk through the fire, it will not scorch me. And like David, Oh, thank God for Psalm 23. Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil because God is with me. He will strengthen me. You have to know that there's another in the fire. Forget the past, but don't forget the lessons. Paul said, brethren, I do not count my, myself to apprehend it. Mean, he means I have not accomplished everything. I don't know everything. But one thing I do, one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind me and reaching forward to those things which are ahead. Listen, some of you need to hear this. I don't care if you're, you were drunk yesterday or high yesterday or messed up yesterday. God says, look to the cross, look ahead, get back on the right track. I'm not excusing that, but at some point you got to say, devil, you had me bound for a while, but I'm coming back up again and I'm going to follow Christ with all of my heart and all of my strength. Listen, he is an all-sufficient Savior. You don't follow Jesus halfway. You don't partially commit to him. You fully surrender everything and allow him, like we just sang, I come empty to be filled. I come broken to be mended. Let him build you up. 
Oh, I come broken to be mended. I come wounded to be healed. I come desperate to be rescued. I come empty to be filled. I come guilty to be pardoned by the blood of Christ the Lamb. And you look at who he is and not your past. Don't be focused on your past because that's where the fiery darts of the enemy come from. And I need to just tell you this right now, young kids, young adults, you don't want a testimony if you can prevent it. People say, oh, I wish I had a testimony like that. No, you don't. No, it's always best to walk. Want my biggest regret, my biggest regret that I will take to my grave is that I didn't, I didn't keep walking with Jesus at 12 years old. I allowed the pull of the world and friends to pull me away from Christ for 17 miserable years. And that verse I know very well, hard is the way of the transgressor. Difficult is that path. Pain produces passion. What I mean by that is your pain, your pain can actually produce a tremendous passion towards God. So you can become broken yet unbreakable. The verse I'm using is Luke 7, 47. Therefore, I say to you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much. But to whom little is forgiven, the same loves little. So here is the beautiful thing, how God can take your past, your brokenness. If you run to the cross, if you turn to him, that pain can result in a tremendous relationship. How much more do I love Jesus Christ because of what he brought me through? That pain can produce a tremendous passion towards Christ. And finally, I can't say this enough. Amazing grace is amazing. Amazing grace is amazing. Listen to this. Two verses I want to close with. Ephesians 2.8. For by grace you have been saved through faith that it's not of yourself. It is a gift of God. For by grace you have been saved. If you're here tonight and you've not been saved, it's not by your own work. It's not by your own merit. It's not by something what you do. It's by the grace of God. He poured out his wrath on the cross on Jesus Christ. It's a free gift of God, but you have to believe and receive. In Romans 5, 8, but God demonstrated his own love towards us, his own Lord love towards us, in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Wait a minute. When I, was, when I was running wild, when I was cursing God, when I was living a life directly opposed to God, in all of that, he said, Shane, I still love you. I still died for you. As far as the east is from the west, if you would just repent and believe in the gospel and turn completely over to me, I will save you. I will set you free. The blood of Jesus Christ knows no bounds. It has no boundary. Nothing can stop it. No devil in hell can thwart its problem. It's power. The cross of Jesus Christ will set you free. He chose the cross. You must choose surrender. With God, failure is not final. I don't know if you need to hear this tonight, but failure is not final with God. As the worship team comes back up, I want to remind you that God makes a wrong turn right. Some of you, I know, a crowd this size, you're on the wrong path. You are on the wrong path. Whether you're not a believer and you're on the road to destruction, or whether you are a Christian and you're living in sin, you're far from God, turn back to him tonight. We are not guaranteed tomorrow. If I could go back and get back the days, the weeks, the months, the years I wasted, oh, I would give anything for that. If you need a financial breakthrough, if you're afraid of what's going on, you don't, need, you don't know if you should take the jab, the vaccine to keep your job. I mean, you're t you're all these things that are happening, LA County's pressuring. I mean, the pressure is immense. How do you not live for Jesus Christ in these dire times? I have a question for you. How do you live without Christ? How do you get through without not clinging on to the cross? How do you do it? Because you can't. You will not succeed. You cannot fight against God and succeed. Make that decision tonight.